Bird ringing is um, catching wild birds and putting a small metal ring around the tarsus, the leg of the bird, which is uh, has a unique numeric alphabetic code on it, which then makes that bird uh, identifiable if it's re-caught anywhere in the world. We'll know exactly where that bird originated from or had been before. Uh, well, particularly at Flamborough Bird Observatory, we don't have any um, permanent nets set up. We bird ring by using things called mist nets, which we attach to poles and stretch between scrubby areas of land. And the birds don't see them, they're, they're like invisible, and they fly into them and get held in pockets like hammocks in the net. There's a number of ways of catching birds, but the, the one that we use most of the time is mist nets. So for Flamborough, where we don't have, we don't own any land as a bird observatory, and we don't have a sites that, we, that are secure enough to leave nets overnight, uh, we have to start from scratch every time we go out bird ringing. So what we do on a normal bird ringing day, we arrive very early in the morning, often before it's even got light, we then erect mist nets in various positions around an area of land and then by the time we've finished it's, it's, it's just after dawn and we're then ready for the birds to fly into them. And what happens then is we set up a base somewhere and uh, we then go on a round of the nets at uh, pretty frequent intervals and we extract all the birds that have been caught take them back to the base and then what we call process them. Processing is identifying what the bird is first, then putting the ring on and then taking certain measurements of the bird. We might weigh them, measure the wing length, we might inspect the state of fat on the bird or the state of molt in the plumage. So we take various measurements and then when that's all done we release the bird. The whole process for each bird takes only a few minutes. In the field, when we're actually bird ringing, all the measurements that we take from each bird, these are all written down manually into a field notebook. On completion of the ringing session, when we get home, all this data then is, is entered into a national database, which is run by the British Trust for Ornithology. And every single ringed bird in the British Isles goes into this national database from which anyone can get access to. Yeah, that's a question I get asked an awful lot. People come up to me and say, oh, I'd like to do this, you know, how long does it take? And in their, in their minds, they're thinking, oh, I might be able to train up for this in six months. But uh, it's nothing like that. It's a very, very long process. To become a bird ringer, you have to, first of all, um, advertise your intent to be one. So you uh, approach the British Trust for Ornithology. You can do this online and you can request that you'd like to start training. Once uh, you've set that wheel in motion, they will then contact one of the trainers, of which there's, I'm not sure, but probably only about 800 in the country, seven or 800 trainers in the country. And so uh, it, it's, first of all, there may be a problem in finding a trainer for you who's not already busy or who actually lives in your area. But once you've set up with a trainer, you go out on a few um, taster sessions just to see that, that the two of you are compatible and also to see that you maybe um, have the right qualities to, to start bird ringing training. It's a, it's a very very difficult skill is bird ringing. At all times the safety of the bird is paramount and in order to handle, extract wild birds from nets, to handle them, sometimes they're distressed, sometimes they're screaming at you, sometimes they're biting you. In order to deal with all these issues you have to be thoroughly trained in, in, the, in the handling of these birds. Some people never ever achieve um, a permit because they don't have what I call good hands. They don't have a soft touch and a, and a sensitive touch to, to, to the bird in the hand. Basically you go out with a ringer. Now 
once you're going out with a ringer as a trainee, for most people, in order to get a license to work on their own, you're talking about three years, three years training. Now, for some people that might be four, four and a half years. For some people it might be two and a half years, but in general about three years training. You need to work over a th three 12 month periods because birds differ in their plumage, you differ in the species that you catch over the course of a year and you need experience with a lot of different species uh, in different states of plumage. So it's a very long uh, process of training to be a bird ringer. Bird ringing is about, well it's well over a hundred years old now. Initially when we started bird ringing, or when people started bird ringing, the main thing they were trying to find out was the mysteries of migration. Where do these birds migrate to and from? Uh, because a lot an awful lot wasn't known about uh, British birds or migratory birds particularly. We know an awful lot more about migration, we know an awful lot more about migration patterns, but it doesn't finish there because migration, like everything else in the natural world, is evolving. Some birds are evolving different migration strategies. Uh, the, the notable one of recent years is the black cap that's, that started to winter in Britain rather than wintering in sub-Saharan Africa. And we found by through ringing that um, these black caps have not originated from Northern Europe as we thought they might have done, or we even thought they might have been British black caps that were remaining in the country. They've originated from Germany, from the sort of Central European area. And so that could have um, ramifications on, on, on conservation issues of black caps in Germany, black caps wintering in England. One of the main, uh, probably, reasons for bird ringing in this modern era is, is possibly population studies. Studies on um, adult survival, juvenile survival after the nest. And a lot of this data, a lot of these studies that mainly university people do, is, is to do with population changes in birds, things like willow tits and marsh tits that are becoming very scarce now, uh, and also population changes within different parts of the country. That has come to the fore quite, quite a bit recently, particularly with things like song thrush, willow warbler. Willow warblers decreased enormously in the southeast of Britain, but they're on the increase in, in northwest of Scotland. And this is, some of this is down to breeding success, some of it is down to a different male-female balance. All these details, a lot of that comes from ringing, the information we put into, that, into the database.